and greetings. Happy Tuesday. Welcome to the Steve Day Show here live and on demand on Blaze TV, radio, and podcast alongside Todd Erzin, Aaron McIntyre, and all of you. I am Steve Dace. Uh, it is good to be with you. We have a lot going on on the program today. Beware of the day that I come on and say, not much is happening. We'll see how we get through the next two hours. But we do have a lot going on today. Uh, at the bottom of the hour, I had a chance to watch uh, chapter one of a documentary series about uh, brave patriots uh, in our military who pushed back on uh, the wicked and evil uh, mandates of the, uh, the toxic Operation Warp Speed poison. Uh, one of them. Navy SEAL Asa Miller, uh, he will be joining us here at the bottom of the hour to tell us about his story and also the stories they're telling in this series that you don't want to miss. That's coming up at the bottom of the hour. Next hour, we're going to play Idolatry or Not with a collection of headlines and clips on a selection of topics. We look forward to that. And then I I didn't necessarily tell Todd and Aaron why we were going to do this for Pop Culture Tuesday, but... There is a documentary on Netflix right now about the making. It's the 40th anniversary of USA for Africa. We are the world. All right. And uh, that was filmed in January of 1984 is when they got all these people together at the American Music Awards that year. Uh, They secretly gathered together at a recording studio, all these major stars, since they'd all be in town for this award show. Uh, And they, they filmed this in January of 1984, the making of it. And a lot of this footage, unedited, has not been seen before. And I, I, Amy and I watched it last week, found it fascinating. And as we were watching it, you know, we just started looking up, you know, some of the performers and their private lives. And I think the conversations my wife and I had about that might have even been more interesting than the documentary. There is there there is a great moment in this documentary, and uh, in the middle of of recording the song, Stevie Wonder tries to hijack it and go off on some Afrocentric tip and get everybody to start. He's, try, he's literally you see this happening in real time. He is trying to teach everybody Swahili and convincing them that they need to put Swahili lyrics into the into the song, um, and they've already recorded half of the song. Waylon Jennings. You watch this happen again in real time. Just gets up, walks out, just dips, tapping out. So, and he literally just says, oh, good old boy ain't, sw- ain't singing Swahili. That ain't happening. I'm out of here. <laughs> it was just... <laughs> That's a great moment. But this thing gets solved because a white guy named Bob Geldof, he's the one that did Band-Aid and uh, Live Aid. That was the big concert that happened the next summer for Africa Famine Relief. Uh, he comes over to Stevie Wonder and says, Stevie... Um, we're singing about uh, Africans, not to Africans. First of all, most countries in Africa don't speak Swahili. They wouldn't understand it either. But we're really trying to get white people to give money to Africans. And none of them speak Swahili. I mean, you guys watch this play out, right, when you watch this documentary. I, I, I think it's one of the more fascinating parts of the oh. entire experience. It's, okay. also, it's also even more funny because Stevie Wonder was supposed to be there all along with Lionel Richie and Michael Jackson to right. write the song. Yes. But he proved to be more mercurial than even Michael Jackson and wasn't showing up to write the song. Well, when you've got like nine kids through eight different women, and that's something we'll talk about next hour. I mean, your free time is spoken for, right? So this was the Pop Culture Tuesday assignment I gave Todd and Aaron is I, I wanted them to watch the documentary and then randomly choose five of the performers and just go to their Wikipedia pages and look up what it says about their private lives. Right? That's all I told you we were going to do. Yeah. And I didn't mm-hmm. say anything else. Nothing else. Okay? I, I have a reason why I, I, I wanted you to do those two things in that order. Okay? And uh, I will explain myself coming up at the end of the program in our final segment for Pop Culture Tuesday. You guys have any other major thoughts after having watched the documentary? I mean, it's history to you. My, we lived through this as kids. You know, I remember skating to We Are the World on, you know, you know, roller skating parties in uh, middle school. Aaron, had you even heard the song before? Of course. Yeah, I've oh, heard yeah? the song. Okay. Yeah. yeah, we used to pan it quite a bit on the old radio show on, on, on Salem. I did some spoofs of it. But uh, uh, different uh, and interesting world 
not really sure what was going on in 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 the eighties and that circle of people, but different, uh, interesting world. It was. I, it, I mean, watching the different personalities and stuff interact was was very fascinating. But we'll get into all that coming up at the end of the hour. We have got to some more or end of the program. We have some more pressing news to get to, which we will right now with Aaron's rundown of what happened while we were away. What happened while we were away brought to you by No Immunity. A federal appeals court has ruled this morning that former President Donald Trump does not have presidential immunity from alleged crimes he apparently committed in the lead up to the events at the Capitol on January 6th of 2021. Not a surprise, but it is a blow to Trump's central defense in the court case brought about by special counsel Jack Smith, who indicted Trump on four counts last year, including conspiracy to defraud the United States and to obstruct an official proceeding. Trump's legal team will likely attempt to appeal this matter to the Supreme Court. Joe Biden, your thoughts? Donald Trump will attorney to debate you right now. Do you accept? You debate him? I, I, him, I too. After at least 19 Senate Republicans voiced their opposition to that traitorous border Israel and Ukraine funding <coughs> compromise, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell privately urged his colleagues to vote against bringing the legislation to the floor. That's according to NBC News. McConnell had, on the same day yesterday, publicly lobbied in favor of the bill. Poor Senator James Lankford. McConnell had him market this bill, pimp this bill, and then left him holding the bag after it admit its quick and furious backlash. The House Judiciary Committee has obtained email correspondence between the White House and megacorp Amazon, showing the latter succumbed to pressure from the former to suppress and even censor books on their platform, which were critical of the COVID-19 and vaccine narrative. Amazon employees strategized for a meeting with the White House on March 9th of 2021, openly asking whether the administration wanted the retailer to remove books from its catalog. Learning Chinese today, today's phrase is, is this a book ban? In completely unrelated news, Democrats in New Jersey introduced Senate Bill 2421, the Freedom to Read Act, to create an exemption for obscenity laws for minors to exclude teachers and librarians and award monetary compensation to teachers and librarians who are criticized. Democrats in New Jersey are trying to incentivize showing porn to kids. Checking in on the state of New Hampshire, where the girls' state track and field championship is slated to go down this weekend. This is Molly Jacques, a top-ranked high jumper who's favored to win the girls' state championship high jump. Molly Jax is, in fact, a dude. And finally, country music superstar Toby Keith has passed away at the age of 62 after a battle with stomach cancer. The fiercely patriotic country crooner busted into stardom in the 90s and was known in the early aughts for his tours in Iraq, Afghanistan, and throughout the Middle East entertaining troops. He did over 300 shows in the Middle East, but perhaps the main reason, aside from his music, why he was so beloved by his fans was his humble nature. Like you see in this video he posted last summer from the back of his Uber ride, seeing karaoke to his own song courtesy of the red white and blue And that's what happened while we were away. Aaron's montage today brought to you by Relief Factor. If you struggle with chronic pain, this is usually the kind of pain that is the result of too much inflammation in the body. You know, far too often we deal with this pain uh, by taking medications that can make us drowsy or have uh, perhaps other bad side effects. But really, most of the time, those medications are just masking the pain. That inflammation is still there. Uh, And so that's why Relief Factor was created by physicians who can prescribe drugs, but they were looking for a daily supplement supplement that would help your body fight that pain by fighting the inflammation causing it. It's 100% drug free. And over the years, 70% of the people, over a million people have tried the three week quick start. 70% of them have seen such great results in three weeks or less that they've stuck around long term. Why not take those odds for just 20 bucks? Nineteen ninety five, just $20 is all it will cost you for three weeks to see if you don't see a market improvement in your pain with the three-week quick start from Relief Factor. It's their feel better or your money back guarantee. You can go to relieffactor.com. Take advantage of this offer at relieffactor.com. You can call them also at 800, the number four relief, or just go to relieffactor.com. Coming up in the overtime today, I have a Twitter poll question. The results may surprise you. No, they won't. Asking people straight up, whom would you vote for, James Langford or Elon Musk? And it's honestly not as close as I thought it was going to be. 
and I didn't think it was going to be that close. Uh, we will discuss the question and the results coming up in the overtime today for Blaze TV subscribers at blazetv.com slash dace. That's where you can go now to become a, dis- a subscriber at a discount to Blaze TV, or if you're already one, you'll be able to watch it there later today at blazetv.com slash dace. All right, to the montage we go, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. The whole subject matter is infuriating to depressing. I warned about this last week. I know other people with, you know, blue check marks and even bigger platforms told you, we're all clear, kid. Now let's blow this thing and go home. I mean, they took the case off the docket. It must mean they're just going to leave poor Mr. Trump alone. I I tried to tell you that they took it off the docket because they have to wait for the appeals court to rule against him and that the appeals court would rule against him. I walked you through what the makeup of the D.C. Circuit Court is. This is the D.C. Circuit Court, by the way, that uh, that uh, James Langford wants to have all of our border cases and immigration cases go through these people. And if you recall, I pointed that out yesterday. Uh, that's the worst poison pill in a bill of poison pills. I'm not done with him yet. We'll get to him in a minute, okay? But uh, just really quick, Here's where this happen. Here's what happens next. Well, let's Steve. And the way the legal process works, uh, it takes a long time to put a child on a ca- you, get out. Get out. You say what? You go down to the DC Google Og and you tell the boomer grandmother who's lost her entire retirement and has emptied her social security account, uh, paying for an attorney she can't afford because uh, she went into uh, uh, Nancy Pelosi's office on January 6th. And you tell her that this is a very buttoned down process and all procedures and everything will be followed. Fair. You go, you go to, you go, why don't you go, you, you go ahead and head over to the DC Gulag. You go ahead and visit her in her prison cell as she waddles out with her false hip with no hope of ever getting out and you tell her that this is a very buttoned down and official process that'll be followed to a t fair if c russell has some peanut brittle to sell you on that one right yeah yeah, indeed until then get the hell out of here with that crap here's what's going to happen the trump team has a decision to make they can now this was a three judge panel of the dc court it ruled unanimously against him they can appeal this to the wider court i would urge them to do that to do if, if for no other reason to try to just four corner and stall this thing as much as possible. Okay. However, they're going to lose. <laughs> All right. This, this is, they're going to lose. There's no argument they could make. Nothing. Um, the minute they put on an official legal proceeding in the DC circuit, uh, that, that, that this is on behalf of Donald J. Trump, the L is a guarantee. Everything else is an irrelevant. So I would appeal this to the full court to try to delay this longer. I would write this appeal actually for the Supreme court is what I would be doing. Um, and trying to put as much pressure on the Supreme court to take this case as I absolutely, as I absolutely can. Um, it'll probably take if they appeal it to the, uh, to the, to the wider circuit, anywhere from 30 to 90 days, depending on what, you know, deadlines and stuff they put on things, uh, for that court to rule on that appeal. Then you're looking at anywhere from St. You know, St. Patrick's day to, uh, Memorial day. We're almost to the end of the Supreme court term, which is June 30. Hope the court takes the case. By then, and then maybe he doesn't rule until later in the year after the election. That's the best case scenario. But understand, none of those, none of those situations the Trump team has any control over. None of them. Absolutely none of them. They're at the mercy of the process. Feel confident about that? I do not. No. Should you feel confident about that? I should not. Should anyone with an IQ above 11 feel confident about that? Uh, well, you'd have to ask how we evangelicals. Yes. Uh, if you do feel confident about that, um, your favorite conservative grifter that you're funding their, ne- their the third extension of their home is thankful that you do feel confident about that because you're the mark. All right. Um, they have no control over this process at all. They're completely at the mercy. At this point, they're at the mercy of needing the Supreme Court to take up this appeal. That's the only way they're going to stop this trial from happening this year. I don't care what's on the court docket. I don't care what the process is, and neither should you. This isn't a court proceeding. It's a political one. These are all political proceedings. The idea that they're going to let the the court availability process stop them from putting the Republican nominee on trial before Tuesday, November 5th. Do some of you even deep state, bro? I mean, some of the stuff you people send me, it blows my mind. 
I'm like, you're the same people. Well, well, he can't do anything. It's the deep state. But somehow the, the deep state is also going to follow the official court docket scheduling procedures. Todd is over here nearly pissing himself laughing because it's ridiculous to say it out loud, isn't it? It is indeed. But are these not the things people say to us? They are. They indeed. are. Yeah. None of that's true. The goal is is to use the courts to metaphorically assassinate Donald Trump. Let me say this again, just in case for the folks in the back. The goal is to use the courts to metaphorically assassinate Donald Trump. They will therefore, it doesn't do him much good to assassinate Donald Trump next year, does it? No. No. What year do they need to assassinate Donald Trump? This one. This one. What year are they trying to assassinate Donald Trump? This one. So therefore, what year are they going to do everything they can possibly do to metaphorically assassinate Donald Trump? This year. All right. So you're going to need four Supreme Court justices to agree to hear the lost appeal to the full D.C. circuit. I don't like our odds, but there's no other way out. No other way out. I don't think the Supreme Court will hear the appeal. I don't. I think I think that um, they were willing to take the Colorado ballot case because that was a clear act outside of the plan. The Colorado Supreme Court at the end of last year clearly jumped ahead of what they were laying what they were laying down step by step in D.C. via Jack Smith in this court, and and so that court that that court needs to be punished. It, it, you know, it, it acted outside of the plan. They, they, they police their own. We, pro, we promote our own. That's, that, 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 that's another one of the main differences between the two of us, our two sides. So they're going to take that case. They're going to throat punch the Colorado State Supreme Court. That's where they're going to spend all of their political capital, I believe. Hey, we made sure he had ballot access. Now we're just going to, we have to let the natural criminal process play itself out. And I don't think they'll even hear his appeal. And I think even if the Supreme Court did, I don't believe there's five justices there that will save Donald Trump from the D.C. gulag. But I don't even think Clarence Thomas is a lock. I don't, I, given the argument Trump is making, I also don't think that Clarence Thomas is a lock. I mean, I'd, if you made me bet, I'd still bet he'd vote in favor of Trump because the spirit of what they're trying to do to Trump yeah. here is very obvious. But, you know, the precedent that Trump wants to set, too, that a president just has absolute immunity no matter what conduct they, they commit in office. I mean, I, I could see a very strict constitutionalist like Clarence Thomas having an issue with that, frankly. But... I would like to have that problem because it means the court agreed to take the appeal. I don't believe the odds are great that they will. Because you're going to need four justices. Who are the four? All right, you have Alito, you have Thomas. Just give you, are you very confident that Neil Gorsuch wants to hear this appeal? No. Okay. Uh, let's do it this way. Confident, somewhat confident, not confident at all. Neil Gorsuch. Not confident. Yeah, no. Not confident at all. I maybe would be somewhat confident, okay, but look at me, Mr. Optimism. Amy Coney Barrett. Not confident. No, that's a not confident. Okay. Yeah. Brett Kavanaugh. Not confident. Not confident. John Roberts. Not. And this, what, so is there, whatever's there, worse than not confident. Yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, I mean, John Roberts <laughs> wishes there was a sergeant of arms so he could arrest Donald Trump himself, okay? Um, as according, you know, John Roberts wishes he could fulfill the left-wing Twitter fever dream fantasies of Donald Trump. He would like to. Is there any point in even no. y- y- surveying the no. rest of the court? No, because we already know where they are, right? I don't think there's four justices there to even agree to hear the appeal. They're going to spend all their political capital, I believe, crushing the Colorado State Supreme Court, and then they're going to let the rest of this process play itself out, which if I'm right, here's what that means. You're going to be seeing a trial of Donald Trump in Washington, D.C. at an even there's never was never a good time for this, but even worse than what they had originally planned. You're going to see this trial now, August, September, sometime in there. You won't have debates this fall. Not going to have those, but you're going to have the trial of Donald Trump for insurrection instead. Hope I'm wrong, but have I been wrong about this process so far? Nope. Nope. You know why? Because I just follow the process and I'm not looking to fulfill a narrative or retcon a narrative and uh, I'm not looking to magically project, nor do I care that I need to say certain things to get even more clicks or views. I'm not driven by any of those things. I just honestly look at facts and that's why I haven't been wrong so far. I would like to be wrong, but they're going to, so far, this is 
proceeding almost exactly the way that we told you all along it was going to. I told you last week when I got taken off the docket, that was a procedural formality because they had yet to rule on the appeal. Lo and behold, like 72 hours later, they rule on the appeal and it's a unanimous against Trump. Let's move on because we've got other great news. Let me tell you what's going to happen. I, I want you to understand what James Lankford and Mitch McConnell did here. And then I want you to understand what Mitch McConnell did to James Lankford. If you're new at this, you're new, you know, the last few years, you've gotten fired up about politics because of what's happened in the country. You kind of hit that age where you start caring more as you get a little older, you have a family, you know, whatever, whatever if, if that's you and you're wondering, how the hell is this Mitch McConnell guy still around? You received a case study in this in the last uh, 24 hours. So what was done here is a Republican senator from a red state who cannot lose and just won re-election was chosen to, quote unquote, negotiate with Democrats. That's Senator James Lankford. They come back with a with a settled negotiation. They do a full PR blitz. The problem is they have to release the actual legislation and it's bad. It's bad. All right. Quoting Dana Carvey as George H.W. Bush. It's bad. Okay, it's very bad. And the whole thing blows up in their face. So what does Glitch do? This, is, this, this does show you that, that Glitch there, is not legally incompetent yet. You know, there's that point when you have a loved one who is on the brink of someone you care about, you know, of, of being sadly given over to dementia. Have you guys had loved ones or parents? Have you gone through this yet? people in your family were right when they're about to be to the point that they can't leave live on their own anymore they'll like have these moments where like the old spark comes back and like every synapse fires and they're like in the zone and they're like in their prime again you know it's almost like it's kind of like the last you know the last gasp of old yeller kind of a thing what you saw yesterday was like 1999 2007 ditch mcconnell absolutely ruthless ruthless suge knight levels of ruthlessness just absolutely does a 180 privately urges members to vote against the compromise when he sees the blowback and keep in mind this is a guy that is you that, that has gotten to the point the last few years of just screwing his base to his face so how if, if the blowback is so bad that glitch is pushing back is, is pulling back that tells you that this is like tarp level of blowback kind of stuff you know what i mean like if it was just moderately the same people glitch would be just like pushing through because he hates you and he doesn't have to care what you think anymore He's on his last lap, and he looks forward to spiking the ball in the end zone in your face. If Glitch is pulling back, that just goes to show we're at, like, freaking tarp kind of level of hate of this piece of legislation. And just absolutely takes the former pastor, James Langford, and introduces him to the broadside of the undertow of a bus. And just full Pontius Pilate wipes his hands of the whole thing and moves on. Hate the game, not the player, man. I know dude looks like Uncle Elmer, but don't think he has survived in that rat-infested hive of scum and villainy longer than almost any of us listening have been alive. Because all he does in his spare time is listen to barbershop quartets. Don't think that. You'll end up like James Langford. Road tread. Absolutely ruthless. Ruthless. What McConnell did to him. And all of it deserved. Don't fret one iota. Shed not a single tear for James Langford. He's not worth the salt in your tears. Instead, praise the Lord. Because you just saw yet again that the laws of sowing and reaping are undefeated. You may never ever be able to beat James Langford in a primary, and chances are you won't. But at least in this one moment, you were reminded the laws of nature and nature's God still abide. The natural law still abides. And you watched 
Mitch McConnell take a steel-toed boot and deliver it right to the very shrunken and microscopic man regions of James Lankford. And you heard him yelp all the way from here. I mean, this is going on while Langford's doing a TV. He's like doing Cavuto and all these shows yesterday. You see, you see this? While he's out there on TV trying to sell this, McConnell privately is just like, man overboard, man. And we're moving on. <laughs> okay? Hate the game, brother, not the player. Hate the game, not the player. See, this is why I got to go to Congress. I got to know. How does this happen? You don't actually work for Mitch McConnell. He's not your boss. No. How do you... Keep getting played like this, people. If you know anything about Mitch McConnell, he lives by the Nick Nolte and 48 Hours Code. We ain't partners, we ain't brothers, and we sure as hell ain't friends, right? And that is what James Langford learned yesterday. And all of it deserved. Would I prefer, and in a, in a, in a, in a righteous era, it, this would have happened because a guy like him would have never even been a Republican Senate nominee in a state where Democrats can't win a single county to begin with, right? That, that's the way the process is supposed to work, right? But it doesn't work that way, does it? No, 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 no. You know, more, more, more people care about, uh, you know, um, uh, who's going to replace Dylan Gabriel as quarterback of the Sooners this fall than uh, James Langford. Uh, more people care about that in Oklahoma than James Langford screwing over America and committing a traitorous act. So that's, that's why James Langford's your senator. So, you know, the, pe- the people won't do it anymore. The people are gone. The country's gone. So all we have left are the cosmic laws of sowing and reaping. And they came into play. So pop the popcorn. James Lankford got what he deserved. Because here's also what he has done. He has provided some level of inoculation to Democrats on what should be the death knell issue for them this fall. They have allowed an invasion of this country. And if it's not for the replacement of the current people in this country, then dare tell me, what was it for then? What was it for? They permitted it. They aided it. They abetted it. So here's what will happen now. Republicans will attempt to attack on this in the election. Democrats are going to say, well, we had a bill, a compromise worked out in the Senate. I mean, the Republican was right, was James Langford from Oklahoma. I mean, we can't, we can't win a single County in Oklahoma and, and he negotiated with us in good faith and we negotiated with him in good faith. I mean, we weren't even negotiating a, a, an independent candidate, Kirsten Cinema. She's not even a Democrat. An independent candidate was negotiating with a senator from the reddest state in the country. And they came up with this compromise that even the Border Patrol Union, you see this yesterday? The Border Patrol Union endorsed it. They did. That happened yesterday. And these MAGA Republicans in the House... These disruptors that want to shut the government down all the time. Oh, that's going to be like a siren song for the normies in the suburbs. Todd, tell me I'm wrong, Todd. Can't. Because the laws of sowing and reaping are still undefeated. They work both ways. All these years that we just kept voting for complete and total emasculated fools. For the lesser of two evils. And we just populated an entire party of them almost. The idea that just like, hey, hand them over the schools for a generation, hand them popular culture for a generation, hand them everything, hand them the universities, hand it all. Things will just work themselves out. The idea that that harvest would never, ever yield a crop, that that check would never come due, that the bill would not have to be paid, that we just keep kicking this down the, down the road decade after decade, doing the same stuff every generation. All the all of these crops now are harvesting now. All of these bills are coming due now. They're absolutely going to do that. James Lankford and the other Republicans in the Senate that were a part of this gave Democrats cover against an issue that ought to be a 90-10 against them this fall kill shot. Well, that was a bit of a fiery open, so an excellent time to tell you about our friends over at Bonner Private Wines. There's Sunai Elogico Malbec. 
from the Calaki Valley there in Argentina. It's the third highest vineyard in the world, preserving its natural taste. That means it comes highly rated at 91 points. No finding or filtration in its production. Boast a staggering 10 times more resveratrol and 93% less sugar than the, the, the red wines you're going to purchase just at your grocery store. And it, uh, these wines, they have other wines there too that you can get for over 50% off as well. These wines are fantastic. We've all tried tried them would all highly recommend them uh, and you only get access to them by becoming a member of the exclusive Bonner private wines partnership if you want to join now you can get other wines for over 50 percent off and free shipping when you go to bonnerprivatewines.com slash steve b-o-n-n-e-r bonnerprivatewines.com slash steve that's bonnerprivatewines.com slash steve Last week, I had the opportunity to watch the first chapter in an outstanding uh, documentary series uh, produced by a a group called Sentinel about uh, veterans uh, that fought back, pushed back courageously against the attempt to turn them in essentially into uh, human uh, uh, you know test tubes uh, for corporate America and for unapproved toxins like uh, the so-called COVID jab, and and one of those heroes joins us today. Navy SEAL Asa Miller is our guest here on the Blaze, brother. First and foremost, thank you for your service. It is an honor to have you with us here today, sir. How are you? I'm doing well, Steve. Thanks for having me on, and it was a pleasure to serve. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about your story. Let's start there. Who's Asa Miller? Why did you sign up? And and tell us about uh, what you had the honor to do while you were serving. Yeah, well, I grew up in a military family. Um, my dad served 27 years in the Marine Corps. So, you know, service was always something important to me. Um, I joined more or less right out of high school and went straight to BUDS. Um, I was, you know, honored with the opportunity to go out there, not having to do any time in the in the fleet. But uh, yeah, so I made it through BUDS and went out to my SEAL team on the East Coast. And um, during my first deployment cycle was when COVID um, kind of was unleashed on the world, right? And so um, during that time, um, we were presented with the choice of whether or not to um, receive the COVID vaccines. And for, you know, different reasons, I'm sure we'll get into here. I chose to stand against it. And thankfully I had 20 other of my brothers who uh, were right there with me. And since then um, it's kind of been my crusade, if you will, to tell the public what happened and also remind them that the the fight's not over. So Seals Beat Biden, the documentary, I was um, able to participate with the Sentinel and making really does just that. It tells the story of of what the what why the mandates were brought out and um, makes connects the dots between why we we can't just forgive and forget and move on um, why the American people still need to fight for accountability. What happened to you when you pushed back, Asa? Yeah, so um, starting out, I was on deployment actually when the first vaccines came out, the the J and J vaccine, and we had just gone through kind of. Um, a little operation where a couple guys got pop positive and um, everyone was more or less asymptomatic. A couple guys had some runny noses, but they used that to kind of put people, force people into solitary confinement and started a rumor that if you didn't get the Johnson and Johnson, this vaccine that had just come out, um, you'd be stuck in Somalia and would not be able to come home. Can I pause um, right so that, there for just a second? The Johnson and Johnson absolutely. vaccine, I just want our audience to know that is the one that the that even the FDA has issued warnings about, and so that's this is the one that right away they're trying to push on the most elite soldiers we have. So pardon my interruption. I just wanted to put that point of clarification in there, Asa. Go ahead, please. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Yeah, so more or less they're trying to push this on us, um, and I I turned it down with a few of my my buddies, and I go into more detail on that in the documentary. So I encourage people to go check it out. Um, but when I came back stateside, you know, I had no issues coming home, um, contrary to kind of the coercion that they had tried to uh, convince us otherwise. And once I got home, um, that's when the MRNA vaccine started coming out and the government kind of pivoted towards, you know, trying to push these vaccines. And because of my experience on deployment, um, I already had some red flags up. And so 
I was able to look into them, look into the, the early science that was available from the beginning on how these things were developed and where they came from, um, as well as such, you know, things like natural immunity. And I quickly realized that not only was it illegal to mandate these vaccines, um, but it was also, in my opinion, as a Christian, immoral using because of their use of aborted fetal cells to develop um, all of the vaccines that were available at the time. And so for both legal reasons and um, my own sincerely held you know, religious beliefs, I decided not to receive these vaccines. Um, but despite uh, you know, many of my friends putting in religious accommodations, they were all denied. We were all removed from our SEAL team. Um, we were all being threatened with punishments ranging from paying back all of our training costs, which reach into the hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars. Um, and also, you know, being put, you know, either in the brig or dishonorably discharged. So very quickly, the, the system or kind of showed that this was not about the health and welfare of its uh, soldiers. And we knew that if we didn't do something about it, um, there were people who had less resources, less contacts than us who would be um, who would be forced into this. So we stood up and um, we actually were able to get a hold of Tucker Carlson who broke the story for us mm -hmm. um, on Fox News at the time and created kind of the public awareness in a moment to start the fight. But as I mentioned, uh, it, it's not over. Where's the fight at today? Where are you today? I mean, have you been denied a pension, uh, rank, um, an honorable discharge? So where's your situation at today? And where is the, the broader fight as it stands right now on uh, the 6th of February? Yeah. So this was about an 18-month fight for me while I was in the military. Um, during that time, I had the option to reenlist. I personally chose not to reenlist. Um, I wanted to see where this was going and, and how it would be fixed. So um, even though I had been threatened with the dishonorable discharge and I'd signed papers in 2021 saying I would be discharged early, I was able to get out at the regular ending of my six-year contract. However, that is not the case for a lot of my friends. Um, personally, I know people who were kicked out early um, who had to pay back tens of thousands of dollars in bonus money that they had expected to keep because they wanted to continue serving their country. Um, they also had something called an RE4 on their discharge, which labels them as um, in the same category as sexual offenders. Wow. And then there were also 8,500 service members across all the different branches who were kicked out, some of which received dishonorable discharges, which more or less is the same as having a felony. It not only re severely restricts your ability to get employment after the military, but it can also affect things like um, owning a gun. And so my goal right now is to be able to tell the story, uh, kind of be a spokesperson for those people who are kicked out and have not received um, the restitution they deserve, but also to point to the fact that if Congress had not been forced to act, over 250,000 service members would have been kicked out for simply holding to their sincerely held religious beliefs. And I think that's the most important thing I want to touch on right now. You asked, where is the fight? The fight is over fundamental rights. It's not just um, vaccines or, you know, service, you know, being able to serve in the military, but it's over the fact that our senior military leadership and our current administration and the established political order is rejecting our constitutional laws, which are based in fundamental reality, which is that God is sovereign and his law and natural law are above all laws. Um, and those are enshrined in our Declaration of Independence and our Constitution and our First Amendment's rights to be specific. And those were all rejected. And um, discarded by senior leadership in both you know the political arena and the military arena and to this day there's been no accountability so the goal that i am fighting for and you know a, a group of other service members is to um call to account those leaders who have been allowed to either retire with full benefits and pay when 8500 service members were kicked out without their benefits and pay um, and also to ensure that something like this does not happen again. Asa, why do you think they have been so vicious in cracking down on attempts to use religious exemptions to this particular shot? Why do you think that is? 
You know, that's a good question. And I think that, again, this COVID situation is is not an isolated incident. It is just a symptom of that bigger rot I was talking about. And so um, they they saw the crisis and as they generally do, they didn't let it go to waste. The you know, we have big pharma companies like Pfizer and Moderna who are protected from having any liability for injuries that may come and are happening from these shots. And whether it's campaign donations or, you know, the media being bought and paid for in general by these big companies, they saw a money making um, chance and they took it. And also, I, I truly believe that there's an effort to purge people with common sense and hmm. especially Christian morals in the military. And by forcing, um, you know, the aborted fetal cells um, that were either in the vaccines or in or used to develop them, by doing it in an illegal manner, they were really testing people to see, uh, are you going to stand and fight for your God-given rights, um, for your religious beliefs or not? Because ultimately, as we've seen in academia, the left um, has taken over years ago, um, pushing their agendas. The, you know, most of politicians have also succumbed to this with our, you know, as they're known as, you know, the swamp or the establishment, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. the uniparty. And the last remaining bastion of freedom and, and meritocracy was the military. It's been the most trusted institution in America for decades. And that that was their last that was their last institution that they needed. And so they used this um, vaccine, they used this situation, this crisis to um, attempt to break the spirit of the military. And un unfortunately, many leadership, um, many people in leadership fell right in line. Um, but we uh, we're not willing to just roll over and accept um, what happened. We're going to keep fighting. We've we've made some progress um, and, we're, and we're not going to stop until uh, we take back our institution. Tell us about this documentary series and where people can watch it. Yeah, so the first episode's already out and available at sealsbeatbiden.com. So I encourage people to go over there, check it out. There'll be um, several follow-on follow -on episodes coming out in the near future. And also there's another organization called the Declaration of Military Accountability. I encourage people to Google that, go read um, not only the statement that they have, but also the petition that goes along with it. Um, so if you'd like to show your support, um, that would be awesome. I've seen the first episode, folks. It is absolutely fantastic. You can watch it yourself at sealsbeatbiden.com. Again, that is sealsbeatbiden.com. Final thing, Asa, what's next for you? This is what's next, you know. Um, I'm not quite sure what God has in store for me, um, but I know that it involves pushing back against these unjust laws and, and mandates. So, um, whether or not that's being called to, you know, witness testify up on Capitol Hill, um, as we've been calling for, or just going around doing these talk shows, you know, using these platforms to encourage people to not give up the fight and to look to the future um, and defend, defend our rights. I have spoken to many of your fellow soldiers the last couple of years who have pushed back on this. Uh, I've written about them, had them on shows like this. Um, I, I know you guys can feel isolated. I know that it can hurt having other soldiers that are still enlisted that may privately say things to you. Like, I wish, you know, you get what you guys did was right, but went along with it and then kind of act like this never happened and everything else. I just want to say on behalf of a grateful nation, well done, good and faithful servant. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Asa. Thank you, Steve. You bet. God bless. Thoughts. I'm more angry after that segment than I was at, at the beginning of the show. I, I don't, the last I heard, the attrition rate for Navy SEAL training is like, I think it's like one or two people who start out of five who start that training make it through. That's like 70, 80% attrition rate. Elite of the elite. Elite of the elite. Elite body. You saw, I don't know if you saw the, one of the books behind him, Plato's Republic. Hmm. <laughs> Elite mind. You heard it coming out. He knows who he is, whose he is. 
He knows what his mission is in life. Elite soul. He's quite frankly the type of person this nation does not deserve. Correct. And certainly doesn't have, it doesn't deserve to be standing post on the front lines. We don't, we don't deserve people like that. And that's why, in my mind, that's why. And he kind of, he kind of alluded to that in one of his last answers about why they did this, why they were so insistent. That's why. They don't want people like that around. We thank our lucky stars. Thank, uh, thank, thank our Lord that there are still individuals like that man still around because the margins are shrinking right now. Takes me back to editing each and every uh, chapter from audio into text of Rise of the Fourth Reich. And so many of those having to do with the military. And just coming away with the conclusion, uh, obviously disgusted that the brass would treat its men this way. But the inescapable conclusion of all this is this is a military that is primed and ready to be turned on you, the American citizen in general. That's the subtext for all of this. Yes. That's the, what, what, what they now know is who will literally follow any order. I mean, if, if someone is willing without any pushback to go along with ingest, with injecting a, pro, a, a substance in violation of the, of the uniform code of military, of military justice, this is not an approved vaccine. Um, if you're willing to, to inject that without any pushback, despite all the real time evidence that is occurring, you can find if you research of the, of, of questions and problems with this. If you're willing to say, I, I need this bad enough that I will follow these orders to the point of needlessly putting myself at risk, risking all of all that the government invested in me to get me to this point, to be the weapon I am now. And I will risk it all to take this injection for something that, frankly, with my age and, and health and fitness level, I don't need on any level. Then if you're willing to do that to yourself, what do you think you'll be willing to do to other people when they mm -hmm. order you to do that? Exactly. He's right. It was a purge. It was a compliance test. No doubt. Hour two is next. All right, back here with Hour 2, live and on demand on Blaze TV, radio, and podcast. Steve Dace here with Aaron McIntyre, wearing his uh, Kansas City Chiefs ugly Christmas sweater. I love that sweater, dude. That's Thanks. That's a great look. Uh, Todd Erzins here as well. Let us know uh, what you think about what we think uh, by emailing the show, steve at stevedace.com. That's D-E-A-C-E. -E. Like us on Facebook, me, we, and Gab. You can follow me at Steve Dace Show on Twitter, Getter, Instagram, and TikTok. If you listen to the podcast version, please, if you have not yet done so, leave us a five-star review on the podcast platform of your choice, especially iTunes, because that's where a little bit more than half of all podcasts are accessed every single day. And we're approaching about 10,000 of those. We'd love to clear that benchmark this year if for no other reason then it would just satiate my ego uh thank you to all of you that have left us five star reviews and thank you as well if you have hit if you have hit subscribe or on itunes follow that way every time we do a new episode it shows up in your feed every single time while we're throwing out thank yous thank you to everyone here at the blaze that, that watches listens um whether it's this show or any of our programs here at The Blaze, and you know, there's several of our shows that partner with Preborn, uh, ours being one of them. And through those efforts, you guys helped Preborn save over 58,000 babies in 2023. That's just incredible. That is absolutely incredible. So thank you to all of you who made that possible. So many great success stories out there that your donation was uh, responsible for by the grace of God. And you might be thinking, man, hey, we're still doing the whole Biden inflation thing. Money's tight. I get that. Did you know it's still just 28 bucks? 28 bucks is all it costs for an ultrasound that has about an 80% chance of convincing that mom who's thinking of killing her kid uh, and convincing her not to do so. That's it. 
You can still get one of those for less than 30 bucks. Some of you, though, you're still pretty blessed. You can give more. Uh, whether it's uh, that widow's mite, that $28 for that, uh, for that ultrasound or more, all of those gifts are tax deductible. They all go to the cause of life if you donate to Preborn at preborn.com slash Steve. That's preborn.com slash Steve. Once again, preborn.com slash Steve. All right, I was going to do this off the air. I just told you guys this, but before we do idolatry or not, let's. I'm going to do this on the air because I want the I want the, I want to get the audience's take on some of this as well. Okay, I'm just going to read this to you. A dear Mr. Dace, my name is Jaden Stewart. I am the chair of the Cleosophic Party of the American Whig Cleosophic Society at Princeton University. Whig Clio is the nation's oldest political and literary debating society and frequently hosts many of the world's most prominent leaders in government, business, and culture to speak to our students. The Cleosophic Party is the conservative wing of this society. It is my honor to formally invite you to Princeton on behalf of the American Whig Cleosophic Society this spring. We envision this to be a moderated discussion on the merits and role of polling in the American electoral process. And then the rest of it just goes on to talk about uh, logistics. Thoughts. I've looked this place up. It's legit. I mean, guys, I mean, if I did, if, <laughs> if, if I showed up at any point in time in my life on the campus of Princeton, they would, you know, are you here to, uh, your, uni- your maintenance uniform is over there. I mean, I mean, I just, not my crowd. All right. So I, I've never heard of this. I had to look it up. My former boss, Ted Cruz, actually ran this society, the conservative wing of this. He was the chairman of this for this group. That's totally believable. When he was at Princeton in 1992, (laughs) I saw that. Okay. Um, I tried to find video of any of their presentations. I could not find. The only one I could find anywhere was 13 years old. And it was Pete Singer, you know, the guy who believes in uh, euthanasia and uh, uh, is a big... Mm -hmm. Malthusian ethics guy arguing that eating meat was uh, not ethical. That was from uh, well over a decade ago. Was the la- was the only video I could find. So, what do you guys think? Is this something you think I should do? Yes, but only if we go uh, take the whole show out there and do several days <laughs> of the show from there. I'm not even kidding. From Princeton? Yes. Why? Why do you want to do the show from out there? I think you know why. Are we going to do this right? Could we set up on the quad? That would be fun. Steve Day Show live from the Princeton Quad. Yeah. Let's do this. There's no way they'd allow that. I mean, free, you, free, free speech. Well, I mean. Could you could you imagine? Yes. I'm imagining <laughs> it right now. I thought I was making myself clear. Yes, I can. I'm thinking that's maybe why we should not do it, because I know I know what you're imagining, and I think it's probably not. Uh, um, I, I, Billable hours, a great increase in billable hours, not in the budget for the show this year. Okay, but I know what you're thinking. Yeah, and that would require us to come up with extra funding for billable hours, I'm thinking. But what do you guys think? Is this something I should consider in all seriousness? Yeah. I mean, the topic, though? Well. Pull. Yeah. Hmm. I mean... Is it something you're interested in? Well, I mean, it's not like it's not something I have written and and discussed extensively throughout the course of my career. Is it something you're interested in this year? Yes and no. I mean, I am I am loosely aware of what uh, those dreaded surveys are saying. I have. You know, we're not breaking them down. I've not read the cross tabs or internals of one of those uh, dreaded things and many a moon. So to be clear, you're you're just are you formally debating? It's called a moderated discussion on the merits and role of polling in the American electoral process. Here, here, let me tell you why I'm thinking of doing this. All right, last year I got invited to speak. Remember, about this time last year, I went out and spoke. It was the first week in February uh, to um, the conservative legal group at the University of Chicago, one of the yeah. more prestigious law schools in the country. And and I went and agreed to do it, even though it clearly disrupted our show. And, and these, these kids don't have the budget for an honorarium for somebody like me. But why did I agree to do it? Because I knew 
in that audience was likely at least one person who at some point in time was going to run for public office, right? I mean, I would think per capita, um, graduated from an elite law school, more people run for public office with that in there as a line item in their bio than just about anything, fair? Mm -hmm. That's why I did it, okay? That's why I'm thinking about doing this, is at least one of these people, if not more, are running for public office one day. And can I plant some mustard seeds there before the the brutally incestuous and ineffective consultant wing of the Republican Party sinks their claws into them uh, and and foxifies them? Can I radicalize them on some level before they get fully and totally foxified? Can I do that? Because that's basically with oh, Fox um, News, with with a few exceptions, it's basically a the broadcast manifestation of the consultant wing of the Republican Party. That's basically what Fox News is. It's noble of you, but I'm shocked you. It's one thing to go to Chicago to do that. I'm shocked you want to go all the way to Princeton just yeah, for that. I, I just and, looked up Slim Pickens getting from Des Moines yeah. to Trenton, New Jersey. Slim not easy. Pickens. I would. If there's some value added though to this, how you, you want me here? Here's what I want to come here. I want to do this. I would I would actually ask for more. You want me to do my show there live? We can talk. That's not a bad idea. If you know what would be fa- instead of we're not going to they would never let us out on the quad, but could we do our show there live for this group? Who are these who are who are the who <clears throat> wouldn't you like to know? I mean, how many Ron DeSantis came from Harvard. Ted Cruz came from Princeton. And then Harvard Law. Um, Wouldn't you like to know how many other the so-called conservative groups on these campuses at these elite institutions? Right? I mean, aren't we kind of more interested, frankly, in what they're thinking when they leave or while they're there? Since they're going to be the, a lot of these are going to be the people we're going to be asked to vote for later on, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. I mean, aren't you kind of more interested in what these people think, what these young adults think, where their minds are, yeah, they give than, us than, a, yeah. than the communist, you know, professor on campus shot, yeah. that you know hates you and you're never voting for anyway? Yeah. I mean, it's the, it's the, it's the, it's the, it's the kids that come out of these conservative, you know, societies at these schools that they're going to ask us later on to vote for to save America, right? So wouldn't you kind of be more interested in what they think? Like maybe if we did one show out there pre-taped, you know, it'd have to be taped. Yep. probably. Yeah, it would have to be taped. We did one show out there and we just spent the entire show just talking to a gathering of these guys and, and girls. What's your worldview? Why are you doing this? What do you look to do? What are your presuppositions about the political process? What do you think? That might have some interest. Yeah, we're getting there. We're getting there. Yeah, I'm kind of talking myself into this. Okay. All right. Let me think about that. All right. Let's get to it. Idolatry or not. Yes. <laughs> That's just the answer to everything. All right. <laughs> he doesn't even know what the topics are yet. Um, I have collected a, uh, a series of stories uh, that I've seen trending in, uh, in the last few days. And, and these are stories, clips, headlines. And so the question on the table is, are these examples of idolatry or not just because we disagree with something doesn't mean it's idolatry it could just be someone has a different opinion right doesn't just be dumb yeah, it could be <laughs> they could just have a different Odds opinion there as well it yes. could just be a difference of opinion all right or they could be dumb that's possible too yes all right um this occurred this first clip uh, we're going to show you guys this one is a clip um this happened yesterday in the florida legislature uh, as activists were expressing their outrage that uh, Florida is going to require you either choose male or female as your biological sex on uh, government identifying documents like your driver's license. I feel like I'm in a playground and bullies are just beating me upside the head. You're not wanted. You're not worth it. You're no good. I feel like I live in a state that if I'm not in mainstream, I should go away altogether. The only thing that this period of Florida history will be remembered for is the trail of body bags left behind as they've left working class and regular Floridians 
poor and without any assistance for the real issues that we are facing. I had to look my 13 year old in the face the other day when they looked at me and asked, why does Florida hate me? Please protect my child. Their blood could be on your hands. These bills are not just a threat to the rights and dignity of transgenders, Floridians, but they're also a fear-based attack that perpetuates discrimination and violence. All right, that video, courtesy of Florida's Voice, want to make sure we give them credit. So, idolatry or not, gentlemen? Sold. <laughs> well, you don't have to keep selling me on Florida, guys. Man. I mean, the woman said, I feel like I need to leave here. That's all it would take? Okay. Indeed. Uh, sold there. You, you drive a hard bargain, but it, we, will t- we will accept your terms. They're acceptable. Yes. Clearly an idol. The, the, the level... I mean, these people who increasingly are the voices, unashamedly so, you know, if just not very long ago, everybody would have been, you know, tell, pulling them aside. People on the left, I, I, I think you need help. They, there's not those were all the four they're all the same person which is why you know this is an idol you can hear it the, the affect the act mm-hmm. yeah. everything at the script yeah that that's what cults do how about how many times that first woman says i feel yeah yeah did you say it like four times yeah, Three or four is, times there. yeah we, we used to say this about progressivism but I, I think it's more apt about idolatry in general it warps the mind poisons the soul and and uh rots the brain and that's what you heard there did you hear the guy did you hear the guy who said my 13 i had to talk to my 13 year old son Mm -hmm. and then at the end he said please help my son's blood could be on your hands i have no agency in my teenage son's life it has to be broken idolatry must be broken and that is a case study that was a tour de force of idolatry i love though the guy who talked about leaving working class families and kids in the dust did he get the wrong did he get the wrong talking points (laughs) because this was not what this was not i'm not sure how that relates to what they were discussing yeah indeed he went like billy joel allentown yeah, that's a wrong issue, bro. But he's, hey, I've seen this up front with my own eyes. He's trying to identify, I'm you, you're me, and it keeps working. He just described Carlisle, Iowa. If you would have thought five years ago, I and my family would be run out of town at that place. Mm-hmm. I handpicked it because I, it wasn't going to be inner city Roosevelt High School or something like that. Mm-hmm. They do identify with that. They, the, my pain, your pain, it's. Which is another idol altogether. The, 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 the victim class idol. That's what they're sharing there. And there's a lot of dupes who do identify with it. It is the right talking points. The reason why we switched from fake news or not to idolatry or not. You know, we talked about this the first show back. But the, about the, because of the level of idolatry that is really being um, branded and packaged as ideology. Uh, when it's it's much more than that and to put a finer point on it, it you have to understand if you're debating someone who just has legit critical thinking reasons even if even if those reasons are godless even if their ideology is godless you can have a conversation a different conversation with them based on logical assumptions and reason than if you're arguing with someone that this is their idolatry, mm-hmm. that they've internalized it to the point of identity. There's no a level at that point. You're in evangelism mode. You're not, you're not in apologetic or you're not, you are in apologetics mode. You're, you're not in uh, debate mode. You're in evangelism mode. You're, you're trying to separate someone from their sin. They, they identify with that so intimately. They're not capable of a conversation conversation with you beyond you affirming their creed and that's why it's very important for us to know which is which here are we just dealing with even if it's a godless ideology but someone just has never been exposed to a biblical worldview or what conservatives think and all they read was Marx, and so that kind of worldview and those are their critical assumptions you went to college with kids like that at at uw back in the day you can sit around you know and over a beer at the pub and and go back and forth on ideas with them 
But if I've internalized this now to the point that it's an article of faith, it's an, it's, a, right. it's an item of identity, there is no amount of logic or data that you are going to present that's going to convince that person otherwise. You're in the process now of dealing with evangelism and apologetics, not philosophical, uh, a philosophical contest. But you can break through that. <clears throat> I mean, you can. I mean, ultimately, it's, you know, in a spiritual sense, it's the work of the, the Holy Spirit. But there's this video that's gone viral in the last few days. I don't know if you all have seen this. It might be staged. It doesn't seem like it's staged to me. But if it's a teacher teaching one of his students to think critically. And the student makes an assumption at the very beginning. It's about J.K. Rowling, the, the famous author of the Harry Potter series. And the student says, uh, given the fact that uh, J.K. Rowling is a bigot, and within five minutes, the teacher, just by asking questions, mm -hmm. asking questions, let's explore that further. Can you can you find an, a, an example of, of her bigotry? And then it, w within five minutes, the student had been completely deconstructed of this notion. What you know, this was a young student, impressionable mind. Unfortunately, I think as you get further and further into life, it just becomes hardened and you kind of get the blank stare going. But if you have somebody like what you just heard in your life and you get into conversations like this, the only chance I believe and maybe the Holy Spirit can use uh, to kind of bust through that idolatry is by asking questions, just asking them to explain why they believe what they believe. By the way, real quick, Brett just wrote me, hey, while you guys are at Princeton, swing by Dartmouth and have Todd talk to them about the unionization of college athletes. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be pay-per-view. Nice. <clears throat> I'm in. What's kind of funny is a bunch of guys who are not on scholarship asked to be considered employees. Dartmouth might just say, well, we're just not going to have your sport anymore. That'll be interesting. Anyway, uh, let's go back. All right. This clip, this actually aired on MSNBC yesterday. And what is being done to uh, get the public uh, to really uh, rise up in various states to say to their senators that they want to see the borders, uh, the border issue resolved? I mean, you're getting migrants beating up policemen in the streets in New York. You're seeing an influx of migrants all over the country that frankly have people outraged and couldn't there be some kind of public pressure put in the next couple of days in some of these senator states saying, why are you allowing this to continue? Because at the end of the day, senators have to deal with their voters. And at the same time, it, uh, in the bill, you give uh, uh, money to Gaza, to, to, to civilians in Gaza and Israel. But the border, I mean, we're looking every day at the invasion of migrants and they're playing a time game with politics on this. Couldn't that pressure put to bear in their home states? That's Al Sharpton. For those of you that cannot watch, you're listening to the podcast. That is Al Sharpton. I think that's Senator Chris Murphy of Connecticut he's so, talking yep. to there. Uh, dropping the term invasion. Yeah, noted xenophobe. Yes, on MSNBC. Talking about migrants beating up cops. It's gotten so bad that Al Sharpton's now here to protect the police. Um, idolatry or not there, what say you? The only idol there is, and I like that Twitter and wokeness. <laughs> mm-hmm. But the only idol might be believing that the Overton window just shifted because something like that happened. They don't, they do this all the time, everyone. And we feature it all. CNN or MSNBC just decides, I don't know, let's throw a bone out there and see what happens. No one's, this has been going on since BLM. Burning, really, they saw cities get burned down. Apparently, there's not mostly peaceful migrants, I guess, we, is what they're trying to we tell see, us. Todd. We see the turnstile of thugs being let out. Over, nothing. This didn't just happen yesterday with these cops in New York. No, no way. This is just. There, there's no. Uh, the idol is believing that somehow we're really about to turn a corner on here when this has all been designed. You don't think they're not going to carry this through to fulfillment now? We really just played the same clip back to back, in my, in my estimation. The, the clips of the, the the activists showing up at the Florida legislature and the clip of Al Sharpton there really just are the same clip. It's like, hello, anyone home? That That's the level of idolatry. So I think there might just be something really simple going on here with Al Sharpton. 
when he walks to his job at MSNBC, now he has to see a bunch of these illegal aliens everywhere, and it makes him uncomfortable. I think that's just the idolatry. I think it's just that simple. In other words, if it happens to your state yep. where I don't live and, and my people probably can't, my, my party probably can't win, then, you know, these are uh, uh, people looking to come to America for a better way of yep. life. <clears throat> but if it starts impacting where I live, if it yeah. starts impacting my walk from Starbucks to the to 30 Rock mm-hmm. every day, okay, or, yep. or, or my car service gets stalled because they're acting out, well, then they're, they're migrants and it's an invasion. Yep. Is that what, kind of what you're saying? Yep. Okay. I think there's a lot I of agree. truth to that. Yeah, I agree. Which is why, even though my preference at the time, and I stated it from a substance standpoint, would have been for Governors DeSantis and Abbott to ship these people back to, you know, over the other side of the border. You cannot deny the political effectiveness of this stunt. I mean, by, by putting these people in these neighborhoods, it, it caused clips like this on MSNBC to happen. You, it, it, it's a clearly effective political stunt for a political party, frankly, that doesn't do a very good job pulling these off very often. So we should recognize that. Agreed. Okay. All right. Next, this is a headline. All right. Or a tweet, I should say, from a guy I like. Okay. Uh, Clay Travis over at OutKick, and uh, um, he's on uh, iHeartRadio. Uh, the Big Ten and the SEC are leaving billions a year in revenue on the table for not being aligned as one business. It's time for the football teams to be spun off as one league, the AFC, NFC of college football. The future is now. I read his piece. He lays out, it's basically written like a business plan for why they should do this, uh, the billions of dollars that they would make, how those that, that money would actually help Olympic sports and other things uh, that, you know, as part of Title IX. Um, and we should just be honest these guys are getting paid they've all been getting paid at most places under the table many many years let's just be honest about it now make a taxable income <clears throat> and that money uh, that increased amount of revenue could actually do even more for olympic athletes like your daughter ainsley for example there's more to it than that but that's kind of the gist of his plan and he has some specifics of how to pull that off so is clay travis from the right here uh is he guilty of idolatry or not Oh, absolutely. This is the biggest idol so far. I mean, these are Fauci level takes. This is big pharma grift right here. This is, I, I don't want more for my daughter. She doesn't deserve more. And neither do any of the football players. And I listened to Clay's eight minute long take uh, on this. And he was uh, talking about this. Why is everybody standing the way of capitalism? This is like the, the guy on the elder board of the church. Well, this is also a business suit. No, it's not. College football is not primarily, it never was supposed to be a business. And now the business side, forget for a second that college is rife with problems, but this is just as bad as wokeness. This is wokeness. This is a shiny idol. And he says, well, I I believe people should be able to be compensated. Well, they are compensated. You go to college, a lot of money gets poured in, a ton through football, but everybody gets compensated so that to, for their talent. Yes, the women athletes like my daughter are just as talented as the football player. They are. So we compensate them. This is, this is a Rube Goldberg too smart by halfway of just saying, mm-hmm. I love football mm-hmm. and my football is more important than anything you love. And this is how it's got to be. It's pathetic. Guys, I don't care what you thought of Clay Travis beforehand. This is pathetic. The, this is the whim of a nine-year-old boy who is, wants to be Peter Pan his whole life. And this is sports broism. And this is soap operas for menism. This is a huge idol. And if you can't connect the dots that people who believe in this are why we have all the systematic problems we have, not only do you have an idol, but you're dumb, too. Realignment isn't the problem. An alliance between the SEC and the Big Ten isn't the problem. The NCAA isn't the problem. SMU and Cal and Stanford and the ACC isn't a problem. Isn't the problem, I should say. None of these things that we talk about, any of these machi- machinations, any of these uh, Rube Goldberg, as you put it, uh, Todd, all of these, root, that's not the problem. The problem in college sports is that the backup weak side linebacker at Rutgers thinks he's worth $100,000. And then you have a lot of people and then increasingly a system in place that acquiesces to that impulse. 
that's the problem. None of this is going to get fixed or go back to the way it was. And that's, that's a sole problem right there. That's the problem. I'm not saying I agree with it. Don't at me. I didn't think Clay's plan was dumb. I thought it was actually pretty smart. I just thought it started from a flawed premise. Don't hate me, though. Sorry, Todd. It's idolatry. We, it's, we got, if we're really going to do this, let's do this, because there's not a bigger idol in America. I think you could argue that that's exactly what Clay is saying. We, if we're going to do no, this, then let's not. do it. Come let's on. go no, all the way. No, we're not. See, that's too, too smart by half. Okay. It's an idol. Are we going to throw it into the fire or not? I, I don't know how much money can we make off of it. See, that's why everybody has a standard for everything else in life. But but I, they come back at me. It's the same thing. Why am I not allowed to have my hobbies on the side? <sighs> All right, let's get to, we got to get to this last one before we run out of time. I just looked at the clock. Sorry, my bad. All right, this is from Libs of TikTok. Indiana Department of Child Services. Indiana. Indiana, guys, one of the most Republican states in the union, uh, claims it is appropriate for zero to eight-year-olds to menstruate. They also say nine-year-olds. Mas- masturbate. Or masturbate. I'm sorry. Thank you, Aaron. They also say nine-year-olds will need information on sexual materials. That means porn. They recommend discussing gender with all ages. Uh, they're setting the stage to get CPS involved if a parent doesn't conform to radical left-wing gender ideology. As this scenario has played out in various states, we, and, and uh, Libs talks about the story in Montana that we just talked about on the show here a week ago. This is Indiana for kids eight and younger to talk about masturbation with them. Idolatry or not. Oh, not. I'm not going to stand in the way of capitalism, Steve. Everybody has a right to make some money off of something. These are the talking points. Why do you expect me to follow that? (laughs) For those of you wondering, hey, is this just a shtick from Todd? I feel like I've got a text to play after this show. Dude, dude, I'm just, I'm sorry. Is this just, you know, Todd trying to, you know, troll or rile up? No. What is the thing Todd brings up the most off the air? Steve, it's this. Pretty much this. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much this. I go back to, you know, one of my early mentors, man, my old buddy, Jonathan Narciss, who passed away a few years ago, used to tell me, if you can't get people to protect the kids that are born, they're never going to protect the kids that aren't yet born. And I think that absolutely applies when you look at this Indiana situation, for example. All right, we'll come back. Pop Culture Tuesday is next. back here on the steve day show powered by our friends over at patriot mobile for a decade now they have been america's only american wireless provider and when i say only they really are the only single one and therefore they're your one option i know a lot of you are more and more looking to see is it possible to do business with people who don't hate me is it possible to not give my money all the time to people that are trying to undo my way of life and the answer to that question unfortunately is no too often But one place where the answer is thankfully yes is with a product we all use and utilize and must in this day and age, our mobile phones. Make the switch today to Patriot Mobile. Uh, They'll give you access to all of the major networks out there that you can switch at any time for free. They have an outstanding customer service team, 100% U.S.-based. That means you can understand them. Uh, They did a great job for my family. I've heard from others in our audience. They did a great job for you as well. I'm confident that they will do a great job for any of you that want to make the switch too. If you're a veteran or first responder and you're looking to make the switch today, let them know up front. And therefore, they've got extra special ways to say thank you for your service. Uh, For the rest of us, if you use my name, Steve, as your offer code, you'll get a free activation when you make the switch today at patriotmobile.com slash Steve. You can keep your current phone, upgrade to a new phone, keep your number, change numbers. They'll, again, customize it any way that they they can for you and your family. Patriotmobile.com slash Steve. Use the offer code Steve for the free activation at patriotmobile.com slash Steve. All right, you guys ready for some Pop Culture Tuesday? Yes, this was this was fun to watch and go in the Wayback Machine. I, unexpectedly so. I told you this was like, I think I enjoyed this video assignment the most. And that 
admittedly low bar because half of them have been alien movies. Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, I was just gonna, at, this, at this point, if it's not a UFO yeah. thing, it isn't, aren't I'll you watch like, it. it's great. <laughs> Toe Jam, let's do it. <laughs> but it was really good. Uh, and I, I can't believe how little I actually, I never thought about it. And I haven't, for whatever reason, heard about it until now. How much I actually knew, how little I actually knew about the backstory of the Yeah, me too. I mentioned we were doing this in middle school. Actually, this is, this came, they, they, they recorded this in January of 84, man. So, I mean, I was in the fourth or fifth grade. So, you know, it was, I, I wasn't in middle school yet at all when, uh, when they made this. Um, and this month is the, well, January was the 40th anniversary of the recording of We Are the World from USA for Africa. And if you remember the backstory, uh, the previous Christmas, uh, a guy named Bob Geldof, who's a big producer in uh, the UK, uh, kind of a Quincy Jones kind of figure, not quite that you know renowned, but a very well-respected music producer in the UK, got a bunch of British stars uh, together, uh, everybody from Bono to George Michael to Boy George, all the UK stars you would have known of that era, and they recorded uh, Do They Know It's Christmas uh, for Band Aid. And that was the inspiration to then do something here in the U.S. with USA for Africa. Uh, And then out of this came the event that summer uh, known as Live Aid, where they had live stages in um, Wembley Stadium in London, if I remember. And somewhere, I think I want to say it was Philly was where they did this. Did you watch Live Aid, Live Aid back in the day? I mean, I watched the whole thing. I mean, back in the day. You can actually go watch the old clips of Live Aid. They're on they're on MTV or, or they're on uh, YouTube from MTV. And I mean, this is considered, you know, for our era and generation, the closest thing we ever had to a Woodstock where all of the major stars got together. Um, it was the first time that Page and Plant had played together on a stage uh, since um, John Bonham died. And the band broke up. So, I mean, this was a pretty momentous event. And one of the closing numbers was they actually saying we are the world at Live Aid. What's bizarre about that is at the time, you and I were, who are these old guys? Uh, and yeah. now they're probably younger than you and I Correct. are now. And Correct. they're coming back on stage. Correct. Yeah. Watching Live Aid as, as, a, as an 11-year-old or a 12-year-old, I was like, all right, come on, let's get Duran Duran on here and get past these old guys. And now I, I go back and watch clips of Live Aid. I'm like, that was really cool, right? Yeah, okay, so you're right. All right. So now... Netflix right now has a documentary about the making of We Are the World, and it's very fascinating uh, as a standalone. Uh, Lionel Richie's kind of the point person uh, for the documentary, and because he and Michael Jackson wrote the song, and he talks about uh, going to Michael Jackson's house for the first time that he's he knew him back, you know, where they were, uh, you know, they toured together when he was with the Commodores and the Jackson Five, and so he's known him since he was a little kid, but this is the first time he ever been to the house, and. Even even already, like, strange animals, like, you know, s- pythons and stuff are mulling about, you know, the, the home. And yes. it's a very weird experience. And and you get all these people together. They, they, they were able to do this without cell phones and all that stuff back then, text messaging or emails, none of that. Um, they were able to get all these people together because they were all going to be in town after Christmas for the American Music Awards, which used to be a big deal back in the day. It was kind of like the first big award show in January when we were growing up and so they were all going to be there and there was a chance to get them to whisk them away to to a secret location to one of the uh recording studios of one of the major record companies where they were going to record this song that was being written in real time by michael jackson and lionel richie it was supposed to be written by stevie wonder but he didn't return anybody's calls and they had no idea he was even going to show up uh for the recording and he shows up while they're already recording the song to say, I'm here to write the song. That, that's, I have it right yes, so far. That's yeah. exactly right, yes. And, you know, they're debating who to bring in, who not to. Uh, they brought in Sheila E. I'd forgotten about Sheila E. They brought her in basically because she was dating Prince at the time and they thought this was the way to get Prince. But since Prince and Michael had a bit of a rivalry back at that moment, you know, Prince was like, well, Michael's already there. I'm not coming. All right. And so then they, the other big debate was over Cindy Lauper and Madonna. Yeah. And they went with Cindy Lauper. Now, if they had waited a year, they would have not even had a debate because the next year was, you know, Madonna's breakthrough year. Um, you know, she was coming off of Holiday and like, you know, her first, you know, the next year is when she made the movie and, you know, Like a Virgin and all that stuff came out. Uh, but right now, Cindy Lauper was still, you know, a huge star after Girls Just Want to Have Fun. So they bring her in. 
And so this is a very eclectic group of people. Kenny Rogers is there. Al Jarreau is there. Um, Drunk. Huh? Drunk. Uh, He's there drunk. (laughs) Yeah. My favorite moment in the entire documentary is when uh, I mentioned this at the top of the show. I'll reset it. They understand now they've already written the song. Everybody's all these stars have all got to sign off on it, right? Because their their names are on it. So they've all signed off on it. They're all okay with the lyrics. They started off the part in the music video, you know, where they're all singing the chorus together. That's the that's the first part of the song they recorded. So they're halfway into recording the song. They're now doing the solo breakouts. And it's and, and, and while they're setting up for the solo breakouts, in the middle of this, Stevie Wonder decides to go full, you know, BLM, Afrocentric, and, and starts rewriting the song in Swahili and adding Swahili terms. And this causes a huge controversy. And you can tell a bunch of people don't want to look like racist and also don't want to tell Stevie Wonder no. And so they're like, they're, they're literally talking quietly to each other. Who's going to go tell them? Who's going to go stop this? You know, and Waylon Jennings gets up off the rafters and just bounces ejects. He shows, he yeah, shows he, them. He says, hey, hey, good old boy ain't singing Swahili. That's my tap out, guys. I'm out. And just he just left. And everybody's like, OK. Well, I guess that's happening. <laughs> that's that, that you watch this because they're filming the whole thing in real time. And know? the other blind guy, Ray Charles, it, it, he's over in the corner and he knows that it's going off the rails. And he goes, "Quincy, ring the bell! Yes, ring the bell! Yes. <laughs> Somebody stop this!" <laughs> All right. And then finally, that Geldof is actually there, and they have to bring Bob Geldof. So this white British guy has to come up to the black guy, Stevie Wonder, and say, "Dude." There's only like two countries in Africa that speak Swahili. Most Africans don't even know that language. And the song is not to Africa. It's for Africa. And we're trying to get white people to give their money to these black people in Africa. And so we have, he's literally telling them this. You Like you, this is what he is saying to him. These words, I'm not embellishing this, right? I'm not even paraphrasing. He's like, we, we have to get these white people to give this money to these Africans so they can not starve. And therefore we need to record a song that they can understand. Like he says this to him, yes. like he's talking to wonder almost like he's like, you know, a child oh, yeah, basically, uh, yeah. you know? And so the, the whole thing is fascinating to watch there's a reason why though I wanted you guys to watch it. I'll get to in a minute and it's the ancillary request that I made along with watching it thoughts though, before we get to that other moment or that other point, what you guys thought of watching it yourselves. Oh, it's um, deeply nostalgic. I mean, having being, you feel like you're being brought back to a, a much uh, simpler time, having them share I mean, this is coming. Uh, you had us happen to do this. We're watching this uh, at the same week, the Grammys, and you know, mm-hmm. like whatever she is, twenty-year-old Olivia Rodrigo is singing a song about vampires, and there's blood running down the walls behind her. You know, uh, I mean, I know, I know. You know, Madonna was pushing, and Prince were pushing the edge of things, and obviously Michael Jackson was a weirdo, but. Like this was, they're walking around and getting each other's autographs. The uh, the, the nervousness the, yes. it, of Huey Lewis when they said, because they, when when they decided this, there's a guy who put note cards around and and handpicked who's going to sing which not lines. Obviously, because of popularity. Also, you get one line and it has to be in your key. I mean, they're instructing these great singers during the chorus. Hey, just stop singing if this gets too high or low for you. That's okay. We mm-hmm. got this big chorus. We don't want. We want it to sound in unison. So it's okay. Just stop singing if you don't think you can go there. These people don't aren't used to humbling themselves like this. And here, Prince can't show up, so he's out. And it's like, who do we pray? And they pick Huey Lewis. And when he finds out, and Michael Jackson's on like, singing the line before yeah, him, yeah. and he's just sitting there. And I'm at the end of this thing, and I'm getting so nervous. It was amazing to see. And you see Bob Dylan, by the way, oh, along yeah. with what you're oh, talking about. Yeah. I mean, he's freaking out. You can tell, like... Oh, he's you know, totally out of his own because tell, he's not yes, a he, he, You're seeing a guy who's one of the most renowned musicians of his era, and he looks like he's trying out for first chair in a middle school orchestra. Totally. I mean, he just feels like he's way out of his depth, and he's they literally have to coach him yeah. and stop him from not ejecting and help him along, yeah. you know, because he thinks he's just completely outclassed. What about you, Eric? I've always panned this <clears throat> entire event and this, to- this song in my head because it really is like the... OG modern bleeding heart liberal virtue signal, isn't it? That's what that's what I've always thought of in my head. Mm-hmm. So my takeaway is like, well, I can see the intention behind it. 
I was kind of disappointed because I like, you know, I like it when I'm right and I have my uh, feelings affirmed because I'm a millennial too. But you you did see some of the, at least the intention behind this entire event. You got to see more of the people uh, and more of the personalities that, you know, they thought they were really a part of something. They did it for eight hours in the middle of the night. Yeah. I didn't know that either. Yeah. And so I, I don't I didn't either. I don't yeah. have quite as um, a dour of an opinion of this entire shindig. It still is ultimately, in my mind, a virtue signal. But they actually did, as you said, humble themselves just a little bit. And uh, that was probably the most interesting part to me. So here's why we're talking about this outside of just an interesting watch. As as we were watching this the other night, Amy and I were just like having some nostalgic moments from our childhood, you know, and we just start randomly researching these artists, you know, and you, and you know all their music and stuff. We don't know much about them and, and their backgrounds. And we couldn't find any of them. With one exception, Cindy Lauper was the only one who had not been divorced multiple times. I mean, Ray Charles has like 12 kids by 10 different women, okay? I mean, there was Quincy Jones has the same exact thing, and he, he's like a Catholic church conspiracy theorist. Yeah, I, I mean, we didn't, didn't, we were just like, hey, you know, whatever happened to this person or that person, and we start just randomly grabbing these artists. So not a simpler time is what you're saying. Yeah, and, and we're like, holy crap, these people are a wreck. Like every last one. Cindy Lauper was the only one we found that was not divorced at least once, but she also has a lot of like whacked out, you know, views on things. We couldn't find anybody, even like you, Kenny Rogers. Finally, I'm like, all right, I'm just going to look for Kenny Rogers. All right. I'll at least give Kenny credit. By the time I got to Kenny Rogers, I was relieved that at least all the children he had with multiple women were in wedlock. Like he didn't have any out of wedlock kids. He just had five kids by four different women or something like that, but he was married to them all at the time. It, it's just a completely different existence and culture than what the average person lives. So when I, I, I asked you guys, randomly pick five of these people and just research what you found out about their personal lives. Who did you guys pick? Well, I did find one that was not... Uh, you did? Yeah. Okay. Jeffrey Osborne. I've never heard of him before. Oh, he sings somewhere out there. He's, he sings that from, from the movie. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. it looks yeah. like he's never been divorced. But all the others that I put... Let's see. Who was it? Belfonte, uh, Waylon Jennings, Diana... Who was that? Diana... Was that Ross? Yep. Diana Ross. Yeah. Um, and then the other one. Oh, yeah. Tito Jackson. I love that you chose Tito Jackson. Jermaine. That's great. Or Tito. That's great that you <laughs> All these big names in yeah. Aaron chose Tito Jackson. Yeah, I, just, I wasn't sure where you great. were going either. I picked Huey Lewis, and the, the, a lot of it talked about his uh, on-again, off-again lawsuit with Ray Parker Jr. Mm -hmm. because Huey Lewis had to sue him because he thought Ray Parker Jr. stole the Ghostbusters baseline from what i want a new drug is it mm -hmm. or which song is that the, one of his songs yeah, yeah and so then the there was a settlement that was totally undisclosed but you couldn't and you couldn't mention anything and then apparently later on at some point huey lewis mentioned something on air and so then parker sued him for mentioning it so. hall and oates are suing each other right now yeah 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 did you guys see that mm -hmm. I they're saw suing like, each other like there's a restraining order in yeah there's something like that yeah i saw that I mean, other you know, Dylan lives in California, but has properties everywhere. I did Kim Carn; she still lives and writes songs in some Nashville suburb somewhere. Um, so, else? so here's the, here's the question: Are you initiated into this kind of culture in order to become famous, or is this the cost of being famous? Do you see what I'm trying to say? Meaning that. Do you, does it require you to abandon your sanity and ethical, um, uh, your ethics in order to join the cult of, uh, of, of fame or does, does, is the, does the fame do this to the people who get famous? I think Occam, it can be both, but I, I, and I, there is a cult aspect of to it, which lends one to think about the former. But I think Occam's razor still applies here, and it's it's mostly the latter. Being famous, wealth, all of that, it leads the to... The free time that you get as a result. These are baseline mm -hmm. idolatries that just people... 
and then they they lose control of the rope and they look back. I mean, it's kind of what you, I never saw it, but you said it, it that's in there with your assessment of what I got for, about Freddie Mercury. Mm-hmm. Like he just, he kind of knew, I mean, he loved this woman. He didn't want to hurt her. But Wrote a number just one kept, song about her. In it fact. just kept yeah. unrolling and rolling and looking yep. back. I mean, this clearly, be, this is what happens in Hollywood. Rock and roll always has. What do you think, Karen? Yeah, I, I'm leaning towards the latter as well. And it's just human nature. Maybe some of like, uh, I think it was Diana. Yeah, Diana Ross. I was reading about, you know, she grew up in a Baptist church. Yep. That, those were her first Stevie performances. Stevie Wonder grew up singing in Baptist churches. Yeah. Yep. And, you know, her life, um, there's peccadillos everywhere uh, in all of these people I'm, I'm talking about. So I do, I do think it is the latter that human beings as a general and pretty, pretty wide rule just cannot cope just very few can cope hmm. with fame and money. Stevie Wonder went from singing in Black Baptist churches to naming two of his kids after Kwanzaa terms. There you go. Romans 828.